Hello and welcome to the Father's house. Um, we're just coming to a time for communion. Um, I'd just like to say a few words. Um, it's been interesting in our house the last few days. Um, we've got the painters in and um, it's caused quite a disruption to the furniture, uh, to the TV for my wife, unfortunately, and to my back. Um, but anyway, moving furniture around, unplugging the telly um, has been an interesting thing. Um, and then when we did plug the telly back in, it's not working properly. So very frustrating. But we got some channels working and um, we've been watching some interesting shows. Um, we came across this, um, I don't know how I found it, but anyway, it was a movie about um, Paul. Um, or it was Saul of, uh, yeah, that guy, um, and um, and it was a story about his um, conversion and and how he was going around persecuting uh, the the new formed Christians and how he not only killed uh, Stephen but he organised to kill all these other people and um, and then it showed that he. Even before he had this conversion, he was uh, possibly hearing things because he, he kept going over what Stephen said to him, I forgive you. He looked him in the eyes and he says, I forgive you, just as he was dying. And um, so I've been thinking about that, you know, do forgiveness, forgiveness. And it's interesting, just this last week, um, we... We all know on the news the Bishop Murray, Murray, who got stabbed while on a Monday night while he was ministering to his congregation, and um, from his hospital bed the other day he made this video recording that you can watch on YouTube, and and he he, he basically says Jesus love you. And I forgive you. I forgive the person who stabbed me. I forgive the person who sent that person to stab me. And, and, and I just love you and I love Jesus. Um, so it was an interesting um, week in all these different things that were going on, not only in our household, but in, in Sydney. Um, so coming to communion then, um, you know, Jesus says um, he is um, he's given forgiven us by going to the cross but before he went to the cross he he said remember me he said to his disciples remember me and to the wider church remember me by these I nearly call them condiments but by the bread and, and the wine so as we come to communion now, you just we take the bread and Jesus says, break this. As I have been broken for the redemption of your sins and the cleansing of your sins in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Please take the bread. Jesus says, this is my blood, and take this also. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more, more fruit. You are already clean 
because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Good to have the Smiths with us. Every time I see the family, the girls have grown taller. Now, for the first time, what's your oldest girl's name? Eleanor. Oh, she's taller than you now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you're a tall woman, you're not a tall woman. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, seems they're feeding on a good paddock anyway. <laughs> I, I said last week, I, I used to manage Bonsai Junction Plaza Westfield. Mm -hmm. That was a, a job I had. Big job. <coughs> and uh, it reminded me I had a very unusual encounter there. Um, mm -hmm. Now I am. So, one of the things I did was to run a big promotion where I had an ultraviolet light sensitive coupon placed on, printed in a newspaper, and I built the, built the ruins of a pagan temple, and at the uh, entrance to the lift, I had at least an eight foot long carpet snake in a glass case. So the people as they came to the lift well and went up would have to take a backward step from the snake. Yeah. And uh, the newspaper came around and wanted to photograph the snake and we got it out of the cage. The reptile handler got it out of the cage. And one of the girls in the office was holding the middle of the snake and she gave it a squeeze and it bit me under the armpit. Now, uh, an eight foot long carpet snake's got a, got a mouth like a dinner plate. Mm. And so it's bit me under the, and ripped the arm out of my shirt and I, I was bleeding down here. And I was, I was reminded of uh, my life in shopping centres where there was always drama and there is always drama in shopping centres. Because not everyone who goes there goes there to behave. A lot of people go there to steal stuff. A lot of people go there uh, to meet members of the opposite sex, so it's a bit of a dating site. And um, I remember working there. And what brought it to mind was I got a phone call from a woman who was my assistant in the shopping centre and the last time I saw her was when she worked for me one day there. And she was so traumatised, so traumatised by what had happened there, that she didn't think she'd ever be able to go back in there. Mm -hmm. Now, I make no judgments, but just an observation that you've got to be living for a bigger picture than how you're going to personally respond to things, don't you? I'm going to speak tonight on uh, Proverbs 23, 7, which says, For as a man thinketh, so he is. And what we think about determines actually what we'll act out and what we'll do. And, and I believe that one of the challenges to the Christian faith is to not think like everyone else. Um... I, I watched this week, as we talked about, as David mentioned, the bishop who was stabbed while he's giving a sermon. Mm -hmm. Not a young man. Uh, he's stabbed there in the middle of the church. And then a thousand people turn up outside and they're all shouting for blood. Mm -hmm. And they destroy 
more than 20 police cars. And spread all sorts of mid, um, misinformation around. And, and we need to be seekers after the truth. Because we're told by our God that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth and the truth will bring freedom. Mm -hmm. Lies don't bring freedom. Yeah. And um, in Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So, the Apostle Paul is presenting us with an alternative. He's telling us that as we think, as we think, so we are. So what you're thinking about, will determine where your life is going to go and what you're going to do. Because your body, your actions will follow your thoughts. And um, one of the most beautiful things God gave us was our mind. Perhaps the most beautiful. And the Bible describes our, my, my, our minds using a figure of a ship in a harbour. Ships outside the harbour and then they finally can get into the harbour and put down anchors. When Australia is discovered by Captain Cook, they turn up at Botany Bay. But they don't stay there because there's no harbour. And Botany Bay is relatively shallow and they can get no protection for their ships. Um, Job talks about those who harbour resentment in their hearts. The psalmist talks about those who harbour malice in their hearts. And James talks about those who allow bitter envy and selfish ambition to harbour their hearts. In Jeremiah it says, how long will you harbour evil thoughts? In Deuteronomy 15 it says, be careful not to harbour this wicked thought. See, when a ship goes into the harbour, it puts down its anchor. And if you have an evil thought, an evil intent, and you lay the, let the anchor of that fall into the depths of your life, it doesn't go anywhere. And I've seen people's lives completely changed and completely ruined by the fact that they can't get their thinking under control. But I believe sincerely that we can change the way we think. When, when I got saved, someone put into my hands a book by Kenneth Hagen and a little book you can download it from the internet. What's it called now, darling? In Him. Not In Him. In Him, yeah. It's called In Him. And you can download it from the internet now for nothing. It's got 146 scriptures. Now, I come to the Lord and I had lived a life of rebellion. I've lived a life of soothing myself. I've lived, lived a life of chronic anxiety neurosis. And I, I'm in a nut house and I meet God. So I have an encounter with God. Who's going to believe me? My little buddy believed me because she saw me change. But change didn't come, change didn't come instantly. I had to be able to make a decision. Today I could walk to the letterbox and bring the letters in. And that was the level I, I couldn't. The next step was to be able to go and buy the milk at a trough. 100 metres from my yard, from my, from my doorway. But in this book, it had 146 scriptures of who I was in Christ, who I was in him, 
and who I was in Jesus. And I wrote them on cards. And I recited those scriptures three times a day, like taking medication, for six months. And it changed the inner chemistry of my thought life. And I went from a position of being totally lost, scattered thinking, crazy thinking. Um, Tanya last night was uh, doing a bit of knitting for the first time in a long time. And it reminded me of when I was ill, I exerted pressure on it because I believed the jumper she was knitting I'd never get to wear because I would die before the jumper would be finished. And it wasn't just an idle thought. I believed that that was true. And uh, not only did I get to win the, win, uh, the jumper, but I didn't die either. Because something happened as I began to focus my thoughts on who I was in him, I have an identity that has stayed with me for more, for uh, 50 years. And it stayed with me because I fed and ate on the scripture, on the word of God. And the word of God told me I was righteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. That was one of my scriptures. So, and, and I had not behaved righteously in my life in any way, shape or form. You know, I lived, um, I lived on the streets of King's Cross for many months. I ran away from home and when they brought me home, I'd run again. And so I lived a life of rebellion. And there's lots of reasons for that, but it was what I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, I wasn't thinking that. And one big thank, thank you I've got for God that they didn't have the internet invented. I don't know what I could have got up with, with the internet. In fact, I do, and I'm glad I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on those things. Because I don't want a Facebook friend. No, I want real friends. I don't want an invitation or a perhaps friend or whatever. I don't, want, I don't want to be friends with someone who's selling my information for a marketing tool. I even know now you, you, you don't know what goes on, do you? All of a sudden... You're talking about an Indian restaurant. Oh, I'd like to eat Indian tonight. And all of a sudden your phone gets all these messages from nearby Indian restaurants. We are being trapped. And, and when... So what we think about will determine what we become. There's a great uh, Roman philosopher called Marcus Aurelius. And if you could ever... Uh, read one of his books that really help you on like ethical thinking and it said the most important things in the world are the thoughts we choose to think uh, Gary Collins says it's doubtless that true people become what they think about and the enemy has a great a great plan to control what you think about because the battlefield is our mind. Most of us don't get to fight fully armoured up demons on the field of battle, but we do fight them in our mind. So, you'll take Craig. In the words of Craig, I saw you, and, and, and people look at you, but they don't see you. You're like the invisible man. But that's not the way it's going to be. That's not the way it's going to be. I saw the angels of the Lord building your life block by block, block by block into a solid, solid wall. And I declare financial blessing over your family. Mm. I pray for the release of every seed that you have planted. I pray for the harvest to come back to you 30, 60 and 100 fold. Mm. I pray the blessings of God to overtake your family. And The devil will take advantage. He'll come to you, he'll come to your heart, he'll give you a thought and then condemn you for having it. And because he wants to get hold of your mind. He wants to get hold of your mind because that shuts down spiritual gifts from operating. That's why you don't hear the voice of the Lord saying, ring this one, talk to this one, do this, do that. You don't hear it because you're too full of your own thinking. 
，所以。The poet, the Christian author Oswald Sanders, says the mind of a man is the battleground on which every moral and spiritual battle is fought. Van Havner says our defeat or victory, victory begins with what we think, and, and if we guard our thoughts, we will not have much trouble anywhere else along the line. In Second Corinthians says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing everything, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And while I was in formation, while I was working, I, I knew I couldn't be the father of seven children, being as crazy as I was. How could you? How could you earn enough money when they told you you would never work again? How could you earn enough money to put food on the table? You couldn't do it. So, uh, desperate measures called for desperate means. And so, when I gave my life to God, I, I have never regretted it, and I've never taken half an inch of it back, because I've never ever lived one day of my life where I haven't needed Jesus twenty-four-seven. Never ever ever lived one day like that. And and. You'd come to the point where you'll be praying, you'll, you'll be in a state of prayer, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me that I was righteous. Because the Bible told me I was righteous. And I made a decision along the way to evidence of what God was doing in my life that I could live a virtuous life, that I could be a good man. And I never wanted to in the end be a good man because I have a list of good things I have to do. I wanted the goodness to come from that inner part, most part of me. So, so that I was being good because I was good. I didn't decide to do, be good. That the goodness was what I what came upon me. And when I became filled with the Holy Spirit, I realised that it told me that out of my belly would flow rivers of living water. So there was a living water that would come out of me and it would water my life as it came out and it would give me insight and, and it would help me value and love people. I've made plenty of mistakes and if you know me very long, you'll see me make a few more. But my heart's intention is to think good thoughts about people. And where it says in Corinthians to cast down imagination to be every court captive, I imagine myself as a rodeo rider with a lasso catching evil thoughts, dragging them behind my horse and dumping them to the cross. So they were done and and I some of those thoughts you'd have to you'd have to ride till you killed five horses to get them to the cross. In Romans it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and, and the perfect will of God. Don't be, don't be conformed to this world. I saw a news article this morning where it's saying that 50% of clothes are thrown out after a year. Into landfill. We, one of our favourite shows uh, is the great British sewing bee. And one of the uh, judges on the great British sew sewing bee is a Savile Row tailor and clothes designer. And he said, can you how many years clothes? Six generations. Six generations of clothes are already in the world if you've never made another thing. They're here. The future six generations. Yeah, if you, and if you open up your drawers, you'll probably find a few of them. <laughs> Let this mind which is which in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 26, 3. He will keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. 
Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. As you begin this love generation with Jesus Christ, so your thoughts become, um, become honed down so that they become your servant, not your master. If you would have told me when I, um, when I was a young man, when I was 16, 17 or 18, that all I'd do is think about God, I would have thought you were crazy. So many better things to think about than God. If you had have told me when I was 25, 26, because I didn't come to Christ until I was 28 years old. And there was a lot of water under the bridge. Jesus had some characters that showed up in the parable. One was the man with the hand on the plough in Luke chapter 9. It says, and Jesus said to him, no man having put his hand to the plough um, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He's saying when, when you start something, finish it. When you start something, focus on when you're ploughing. You imagine getting behind a couple of, a couple of oxen with a plough uh, and 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 not follow it straight and let them get off get off the hill. What about when they hit stones and they hit rubbish and whatever? You've got to hold on tight to the plough. You get blisters. You'd have to be pushing the plough forward, pushing the plough forward, telling the oxen to keep going, not letting them go to the left or the right, and you'd have to be standing behind them. And Jesus says, when you get when you get focus, don't lose your focus. Don't get off track. Jesus was addressing a crowd of people, and there were various uh, a lot of people that were thinking about following Jesus, but a lot of them had trouble with it. One man couldn't give up his home. One man couldn't give up his dead relatives. One man couldn't give up his family, and that they. That prompted the metaphor that Jesus used that day. When you get behind the plough, keep ploughing. Keep going. Jesus, as a young man, would have watched many people plough fields because his father would have made ploughs. And Jesus would have helped his father make ploughs. And no doubt, because they were making for their local area, it would have seen people use the plows that he made. So he knew what his dad was talking about. He observed the precision in which you had to plough and dig the earth. You could see that the plough had to sink deep and when it got to hard ground where there were rocks and roots and there, were con and there was contentions in the earth, he never lost his fo focus. They had to keep ploughing. I wonder how many blisters Jesus had in his life. He worked with his hands all the time. I wonder as a carpenter how many splinters he got. All pointing to the death he was going to die. The inventor and politician Benjamin Franklin identified 13 values, 13 virtues, which regular practice would make him a better and more successful person. These 13 virtues were temperance, or self-control, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. And he knew that just by writing them down wouldn't get it done. So he would take each one of those 13 virtues and on a roster spend one week dedicated to each of those 
virtues, working out ways he can improve it in his life. And when he got to the end of 13, he'd start again. Huh? So this week would be temperance week. This week would be cleanliness week. This week would be. Each week, he believed he could create, he could create a habit of behaviour that would stay with him over time. When John wrote the book of Revelations, he saw a vision of a throne and a lampstand and seven lampstands, donating the seven spirits of God, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and the fear of the Lord. These are the intentionality to which God is pushing us towards. That's what we'll be called about. Our life must be in focus. A lot of people, I've seen people sink on, on the rocks of friendships that they knew they shouldn't have, that they weren't prepared to give up. Can I tell you, not one of those people, and there are probably hundreds, is still have those people as friends. A lot of people, um, one of the great saints of the church said, Lord, make me a saint, but not today. Because uh, he wanted to stay in one besetting sin and didn't want to give it up. Some give back, some, some look back like Lot's wife. They're running, she's free. The only thing she has to do is look forward and she looks back and that's the finish of her. Where your mind is, your body is going to follow. Martin Luther, 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 Luther King wrote this. I remember another experience I used to have in Atlanta I went to high school on the other side of town to Booker T. Washington High School. I had to get the bus that was known as the 4th Ward and ride over to the west side. In those days, rigid patterns of segregation existed on the buses and all Negroes had to sit at the back of the bus. Whites were seated in front and often it was the whites, uh, when the whites didn't get on the bus, there were empty seats, but we were not permitted to sit in them. So I would get on the bus, walk past empty seats, up to the back where it was full, and I had to stand up. But I wouldn't let my... I might, my, I might have sat up the back, my body might have been up the back, but my mind was up the front. And I said to myself, one of these days, I'm going to put my body where my mind is. And he, and he did. Our bodies will always end up where our mind is. If you can think it, then God can help you do it. Jesus also meets a man in the, in the parables in Matthew 13. The merchant man who searched the world for great pearls, and when he paid, paid a pearl of great price, he made a decision, I'm selling all the pearls I've got to buy this one. A lot of times our jewellery box is filled with second-rate pearls because we haven't sought the pearl of great price. We haven't known, we haven't known what's going to count for us. When President Kennedy in the 60s, when he came uh, to power, uh, when he, he gave a speech on May 21, 1961, he, he, I believe this nation 
should commit to achieving the, the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon. What an outrageous, what an outrageous statement. And six years after his death, because he focused the nation on it, they landed a man on the moon. There's never been another one landed, has there? A one only event. But he focused the nation to get it done. Paul carried this pearl of great price through his imprisonment. You know, a lot of people talk about winning lotto. Well, what would you do with the money? How much of it would actually go to charity? How much would? How much would that charity be you? <laughs> would you stick with the car you're driving now? Would you live in the house you're living in now? Yeah. <laughs> My daughter lives at Tamarama and across the road from where she lives, a man bought a house for $40 million, which he is demolishing to build a house for $100 million. Now the land's about, you know, a thousand square metres. It's almost going to be as dear, dear as the Temple of Solomon now if you build it. What are you going to do with your life? What are you thinking about? What are the goals you'd like to do in the future based on uh, on on what on that, what you now know? What are the obstacles stopping you? See, Tanya and I when we ask God about this little church, we've had, we've had hundreds of years, so we, we know it's like to be big and we know it's like to be small. Um, and can I tell you what he tells us? Well, if you're helping anyone, you're not to go anywhere. That's the end of the story. So once I've heard from him, what people think about, you can't stop you. You can't think about, well, what are they thinking about me? What are they thinking? You can't do that. I'm not going to let you rent space in my mind. <laughs> it's not for rent. I have a landlord. And, a, and you're not going to be me landlord. Because we're here to control what we think. I believe we can... I believe... I see people come and they're tormented about a lot of things. And I give them this simple thing. Download Kenneth Hagin's book, In Him, and write it out on cards and read them three times a day, in six months, your problems would have disappeared. Now, the first few times you do it would be very hard. And sometimes you won't, and, and sometimes you might forget to do it, or you might not feel like doing it. But if you've got to be working, 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 so that you improve what you think about. You can't get, you can't, um, you can't be worried about what your boss thinks about you, what your way, how far your wages are going to go, or anything like that, because God truly is in charge. Are you still working the same job, Hod? You're not. You're not at the same job now. Um, I've got two at the moment. So. Uh, I can't remember what one I was doing before. You're out at Glenball Park, I think. Oh, no, I'm at Lura and another one in Marsden Park. So oh, do you know? well, you're doing a bit of driving then. Yeah, about yeah. 40 minutes, that's right. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have the Smith family. We'll pray for them tonight, uh, that each one of them will be blessed for their attendance. And uh, we just... Thank you for them. We've known them many years now. And uh, we thank you for their faithfulness mm -hmm. and the honour that they carry as a family. Mm -hmm. I pray for all of us that we think about God a lot. I just, fin I just finished reading a book which I've read for six months. It's by 
a guy called Brian Wills. V Y R A N. Brian Wills. And it's called 10 Hours to Live. And this guy at 22 is diagnosed with a cancer for which they're giving him just a, a week or so to live. And it's a cancer that doubles in size. So it starts off as a, go, a golf ball, and then it's a softball, and then it's a basketball. And he's put up on Ward 13, which is the dying ward in the cancer hospital. He gets up there, and he just starts to quote the scripture, read the scripture, his family read the scripture. They stick him up on stickers around his room. Uh, his mother comes in and pushes him around in a wheelchair so that she can pray for other people in the ward. And he was totally and completely healed and has a healing ministry on the ministry of healing. How do you receive your healing? So it's called How to Receive Your Healing. And one of the things that I noticed in that book was that mostly he went to pray with people in the hospital who were sick and never, never got better. He said, now, if you pray for someone in the hospital, they should prepare to go home, shouldn't they, because you're praying for them. They shouldn't just... Um... But he's talking about going to pray for people who are on monitors and they pray until they see some movement on the monitor. They're, um, they're on life support. And I thought to myself, would I do that? And I would do it. I have seen one person come back from the dead. I have seen that. Uh, um, and, but I've seen some people die hard too, you know. But, and I say this in some humility, the one I saw come back from the dead died a few days later and I know why that happened, but I believe that um, if I had a kept praying, she would have probably lived, you know, so. So, I want us to be, see, we can be caught in a way of thinking that never pushes us outside the box, never pushes us somewhere. And uh, I can come here every week and I can remember things that I've seen happen before my very eyes here. So I pray for you that the sense of wonder in serving God would never leave you. Of course, God's wonderful. The sense of following him, of loving him, of knowing that you're loved by him, of knowing that there's a place in his heart for you that he died to you personally and he knows your name and you're not forgotten. You're not you're not hiding behind you're not hiding behind the door. You're not like David left out in the cold by his brothers by his father. No, you're here, right in the heart of God. So I pray for you and I pray for myself. I pray for all the faithful people who uh, put some money in our account every now and again. We thank God for them. We pray that God return for what you give, 30, 60 and 100 fold. Be blessed in his name. Amen.